Hi class, this is Dr. Shahada, and in this video I'll be going over Chapter 10 on Long-Term Care. So in this week's module, you will have be provided, you'll have the link for the PowerPoint presentation on long-term care. There it is. And then below that is a file on the terms presented in the chapter, as well as the definitions. So let me slowly scroll down this page in this week's module, which is the sum information from the chapter page. And I will be jumping to the PowerPoint presentation to cover some of the topics addressed in the chapter. All right, so first, here is a bubble graph, and it provides an overview of the different levels of long-term care, CCRC, which is right on the top there, stands for the Continuum Care Retirement Communities. And just really quick, as you can tell, um, you know, the, the levels of care going up, obviously it increases in cost, as well as from here on down when it comes to the level of care and supervision, okay? Now let me go a little further down. Then here are the different levels of care. Be sure to read it over. Oh, and really quick, I just want to make sure that when you guys see the ADL, it's activities of daily living. Before I go any further, I want to jump to the long-term care PowerPoint presentation and discuss long-term care um, in a little more detail. All right, so here we are in the PowerPoint presentation for long-term care. Now, to put it simply, long-term care or LTC includes a variety of services for clients of any age who have dependencies because of functional deficits. So reasons would include chronic conditions, comorbidities, serious illness or injuries, and cognitive impairment, which may lead to functional decline. Now, most of these services are used by the elderly. On the other hand, the majority of the elderly do not use long-term care. So it's about 70% of older Americans that will eventually need some type of long-term care. So as I mentioned before, age is not the primary determinant for long-term care. It's functional impairment um, that leads to that dependency and the need for long-term care. So although functional impairment may be more common among the elderly, Again, it does not mean that all elderly people require long-term care. Many elderly people continue to function independently regardless of age. Some may use adaptive devices but may not require any long-term care services. On the other hand, long-term care is not confined, again, to the elderly, even though the elderly are predominant users. Some children need long-term care from an early age because they're born with a physical or mental limitation. So others may develop limited functional capacity in youth as a result of severe trauma or a crippling disease. So be sure to keep that in mind. Now, long-term care is a complex, a complex, excuse me, subsystem that escapes a simple definition. Um, numerous services and sources of financing and regular health insurance generally does not cover long-term care. Private long-term care insurance has been, has made limited headway, of course, is available. So again, who needs it? As I mentioned earlier, um, people with chronic diseases, and with chronic care, we're looking at permanent or indefinite period of time. Impaired, leading to a decrease in or loss of ability to perform. Disabled, short or long term and varies by age. And functional ability. 
So a person's ability to perform the basic activities of daily living. Again, ADL, that's what it stands for. So in the slides, when you see ADL, I just want to make sure that you're aware of what that acronym stands for. So long-term care services should fit the needs of different individuals, address the changing needs over time, and suit people's personal preferences. All right, so some characteristics. So we're looking at physical or mental, temporary or permanent, permanent um, issue. Uh, it's need based on functional disabilities, promotes or maintains health and independence in functional abilities and quality of life. Um, the aim is to enable um, people to die peacefully and with dignity. Uh, there's multiple services and multiple professions spanning a broad spectrum. It's multifaceted and it's designed around un a unique um, unique type of needs of the individual and the services can change over time. So long-term care again should be tailored to the needs of the individual. So this includes assessment, plan of care, customized interventions, information obtained from which I do need to fix that typo. A comprehensive assessment is used to develop an individualized plan of care. All right. So long-term care providers, they're responsible for managing total health care needs. So when we're talking about total care, um, this requires that any health care need is recognized, evaluated, and addressed by appropriate clinical professionals. So when an individual's ability to independently perform certain common tasks of daily living declines drastic drastically, they're usually in need of long-term care. So extended period of care. So short duration. A short duration of long-term care usually lasts less than 90 days. Most patients need long-term care over a longer duration of time because the underlying causes for functional decline are usually irreversible. Okay, so it's usually a long-term uh, period of time, but when we're talking about a short duration, a little less than 90 days or less, less than 90 days. All right, so holistic care. Now, holistic care, we're talking about a patient's physical, mental, social, and spiritual needs and preferences, which should be incorporated into the delivery of long-term care. So it emphasizes the well-being in every aspect of what makes a person whole. All right, now for quality of life. So quality of life produces a sense of satisfaction, fulfillment, um, self-worth, right? So in long-term care, it is a multifaceted concept that recognizes at least five factors. So the first one they touch on here is life, lifestyle factors, which are associated with personal enrichment and making one's life meaningful through activities one enjoys. So many older people still enjoy pursuing their former leisure activities. There's also living environment. So the living environment must be comfortable, see, and appealing to the senses. Cleanliness, decor, furnishing, and other aesthetic features are important. Then clinical palliation. So it should be available for relief from unpleasant symptoms such as pain or nausea, for instance, or um, when a patient is undergoing chemotherapy. So the idea is that it's there to relieve unpleasant symptoms. Now, the next one is human factors. Now, human factors um, refer to caregiver attitudes and practices that emphasize caring, compassion, respect, and preservation of human dignity for the patient. 
quality of life is also enhanced when patients residing in a long-term care facility have some latitude to govern their own lives. And last is a very important one, personal choices. So being able to make personal choices is important to most people. So exam examples are menu of choices, ability to set one's own schedule for morning care, bathing, and grooming. All right, so it's, it's you know, having that feeling that you have power over your life of what's going on over your schedule. All right, so to the next slide. Um, Long-term care services. So we have medical care, nursing, and rehabilitation. So services are provided under the direction of a physician. So we're looking at post-acute continuity of care, clinical management of chronic illnesses and comorbidity, and restoration of or maintenance of physical function, mental health services, and dementia care. So this includes mental health disorders that are frequently comorbid in older adults. Comorbidity may obscure diagnosis of psychiatric illness in geriatric patients. So mental care becomes challenging. Dementia is common among institutionalized patients. Social support, a very important one. So social support, um, you know, needed to help cope with adverse life events. Uh, social support helps with the adaptation to surroundings, conflict resolution, coordination of total care needs. So whatever a patient needs within or without the long-term care system, um, it's important for institutional patients the connection with the outside world. Now, preventative and therapeutic long-term care really helps in delaying institutionalization through appropriate community-based care, which emphasizes nutrition and enables access to routine medical care. So therapeutic services, such as nursing care, rehabilitation, and therapeutic diets are specified in a plan of care under the direction of the physician. We also have informal and formal care. So most long-term care is unpaid. It's usually delivered by family, friends, and surrogates. So men, minorities, married individuals, and those with less education are more likely to receive informal care. The main issue with informal care is it's a shrinking pool of informal caregivers. The numbers of divorced and unmarried elderly is on the rise, and that's of course impacted you know, the availability of informal caregivers. Um, one that I actually forgot to include there is respite care. So uh, respite care provides temporary relief to informal caregivers. Services can include adult day care, home health care, or temporary institutionalization. Community-based and institutional services include home and community-based services, also known as HCBS, which enable people to live independently. Functional deficits in three or more ADLs or activities of daily living dramatically raise the probability of institutional care. Um, housing, so independent living facilities and retirement living centers and communities, they must support physical function. Supportive services may or may not be available. Private and public housing, depending on the income. And end of life care. So this the aim is to prevent needless pain and distress for the terminally ill. Dignity and comfort are emphasized. And this is an example would be hospice services. All right, so now I'm going to jump to slide number 17 on mental health services. Now, assessing psychiatric illness in geriatric patients can be difficult 
mainly because of medical comorbidities may obscure a psychiatric diagnosis. So an example of this would be the patient with multiple chronic illnesses can often have symptoms of either dementia or depression, which is attributed to the primary medical condition rather than to an underlying psychiatric illness. So elderly people with mental disorders are less likely than younger adults to be diagnosed and to receive needed mental health care. Dementia is also prevalent among the elderly, many of whom are institutionalized. So um, again, you have a lot of long-term patients that suffer from mental conditions. Uh, mental disorders affect about 20% of the elderly. But I do want you to remember that a lot of times um, they're less likely to receive the mental health care they need because there are so many other um, ailments or issues that health issues that they have that are being addressed. Now, dementia. So it's progressive, irreversible um, decline in cognition, thinking, memory. 15% of people age 70 and over have dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common. It affects about 5 million elderly in the U.S. And 40% of those with dementia need institutional care. Social support. So long-term care clients need social and emotional support to cope with life-changing events. Social support is also needed to address issues and problems that may arise. Social services are needed to facilitate coordination with total care needs. Now, the primary goal uh, preventative and therapeutic long-term care is to prevent or delay institutionalization in long-term care facilities. So it's really a preventative measure. Elderly receive good nutrition and have access to services. An example of this would be routine medical care. 92% of community dwelling residents receive unpaid help, meaning they have informal care, and this is care usually provided by family and friends, and adult children and spouses account for 70% of informal caregivers. And I did briefly touch on the topic of respite care. Just keep in mind that respite care is the most frequently suggested intervention to address family caregivers' feelings of stress and burden. So the, object, the objective is to provide relief or assistance to caregivers for limited periods to allow them some free time without neglecting the patient. And this could include any kind of long-term care service, such as adult daycare, which allows people to work during the day, or a temporary institutionalization, which allows families to go on a vacation, for example. All right, so now the next slide, we are covering the topic of community-based and institutional services. So institutionalization becomes necessary when activities of daily living impairments become high or behavioral problems develop. So the primary goal becomes to, um, with institutionalization, is to provide the help for the activities of daily living functions that the patient is experiencing, implementing measures to prevent further degeneration, and coordinate services with non-long-term care providers to address the patient's total care needs. Now, paraprofessionals, when that term is mentioned in the chapter, it's the personnel who provide basic activities of daily living. Now, key, a key social aspect of long-term care is housing. So health and housing are usually interrelated for the elderly and disabled. The physical features of housing affect the ability of the elderly and disabled to care for themselves. So it needs to be 
a place where the actual structure of um, the housing facility has that in mind that those whatever you know disabilities they may that the long-term care patients may have um, that needs to be put into consideration. Uh, congregate housing offers privacy and companionship by offering each resident a private bedroom or an apartment so they feel like it's you know their own. Now when it comes to end-of-life care End-of-life care, the focus is preventing needless pain and distress for the terminally ill patient and their families. So three-fourths of all deaths occur um, at the age of 65 and older. Terminal patients are referred to a hospice service. Now we're going to talk a little about the clients, long-term care clients. So we have the older adults children, adolescents, young adults, and people with HIV. So older, older adults, so we're looking at in the beginning of the 20th century, those around 65 uh, accounted for about 4% of the U.S. population. And in 2008, the elderly population accounted for about 12.8% of the U.S. population. Now the estimated amount for the year of 2030 is it will be increasing to about 19 percent and this is the age group of 65 and older so the growing elderly population will put a financial strain on the shrinking group of taxpayers now regarding children and adolescents so some children and adolescents adolescents need long-term care if they have a birth um, related functional impairment this could include like brain damage which can occur before or during child's birth so examples of birth related disorders include cerebral palsy autism spina bifida and epilepsy these children grow up with development disability and need help with activities of daily living some children also have intellectual disabilities such as Down syndrome and they all also grow up to be de developmentally disabled. So again a developmental disability we're looking at a general physical incapacity um, that a child may face at an early age. Uh, mental retardation which is where the intellectual functioning is below average young adults we're looking at permanent disability among young adult young adults commonly stemming from neurological malfunctions and this could be um, ms or degenerative condition traumatic injury or surgical complications all right now we're going to touch on people with hiv and aids as again we've spoken about um HIV and AIDS in the chapter that touched on special populations or underserved populations. So AIDS has evolved from an end-stage terminal illness into a chronic condition. So, so with the use of highly active antiretroviral therapy, you have people that are HIV positive staying in that stage of HIV where it doesn't progress to full-blown AIDS. So Again, it has evolved into this chronic condition. So with reduced mortality, the prevalence of HIV in the population has actually increased, including among the elderly. So as HIV AIDS patients age, they become susceptible to multiple comorbidities and cognitive impairment. HIV and AIDS patients are at a high risk of developing various types of cancers, depression, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. Older people living with HIV have lower levels of physical ability and less independence compared with younger people. These factors indicate a greater need of long-term care services among people with HIV and AIDS. So many older adults 
living with HIV are disconnected from traditional informal support networks and rely heavily on formal care providers. All right, so now I am going to jump to slide 34. So in this slide, we are covering the topic of the level of care continuum. Now, I know that these are also listed in this week's module, but um, I did want to just briefly cover it. So we're talking about personal care. This is light assistance with basic activities of daily living. An example would be bathing and another, you know, informal care or the care regarding ADL is usually provided by paraprofessionals. Then we have custodial care. So this is a non-medical care to support and maintain function. Um, and then we have restorative care. So this is more short-term therapies by licensed therapists to help regain or improve function. And skilled nursing care, which is clinical care that's provided by licensed nurses under the direction of a physician in accordance with a plan of care. And last we have listed is subacute care, um, which is post-acute technically complex services. So applies to uh, people who remain critically ill. Um, it's the post-acute services for people who remain critically ill during the post-acute phase of an illness or injury. Now, here are the four types of community-based long-term care services. So there are four main objectives when we're looking at community-based long-term care. The first is to, de to deliver long-term care in the most economical and least restrictive setting whenever appropriate. To supplement informal caregiving when advanced services are needed, or to substitute informal services when a person lacks a social network to receive informal care. The third is to provide temporary ris respite care to informal caregivers. And last is to delay or prevent institutionalization. All right, and now in the next slide, we're looking at the types of um, financing for formal community-based services. So there's the private out-of-pocket payments, private long-term care insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, and other public sources. Home health care. So home health care is a community or hospital-based home health agency that sends health care professionals and paraprofessionals to a patient's home. Services must be approved by a physician. Skilled nursing care is the most common service, and Medicare is the single largest payer. Now, when we're looking at adult day care, um, clients usually stay with family and friends, but they can't be left alone during the day. So that's the whole idea. Um, it provides partial respite. Uh, now, adult foster care, it really has a family environment in a small community-based dwelling. So services are prim primarily focused on room and board, supervision, and light activities of daily living assistance. Funding for AFCs or adult foster care comes from Medicaid, private insurance, or personal sources. Now, they differ widely state to state. So senior centers, um, these are local community centers where seniors can meet and socialize. They may offer one or more meals and wellness programs. And then home delivered meals and congregate meals. An example would be Meals on Wheels. Um, and it's really an elderly nutrition program under the Older Americans Act. So people age 60 and above um, and their spouses may qualify. Area agencies on aging contract out uh, meal preparation and delivery. 
Now I want to jump to slide number 42 on the three traditional long-term care models. All right, so let's start with the brokerage model. So once needs have been independently assessed, case managers arrange services. Now the second model here is the managed care model. Services are provided through a social managed care plan which coordinates acute, chronic, long-term care and social services to address a patient's comprehensive needs. Um, the preventative and supportive services are strongly emphasized in this model. And we have professionally trained nurses and social workers who are, the tip, are typically the case managers. And they're also likely to be more closely involved in the monitoring and coordination of services, which is not the case in the brokerage model. Next, we have the integrated care model. So this model exists within an interdisciplinary organizational structure that strives to provide all necessary services that the clients need. Services include medical social and social services, um, such as counseling, advocacy, and ongoing coordination and monitoring. So the goal is ongoing prevention of the progression of the disability. At the core of the program is adult day care augmented by home care and meals at home. Similar to manage, the managed care model, capitation is used for which funding comes from both Medicare and Medicaid. The program focuses on frail elderly who have already been certified for, nurse, for nursing home placement under Medicare or and or Medicaid. All right, now I'm going to jump back to the information provided in this week's module on long-term care. I do want to remind you that I expect you to read the full chapter and go through all the PowerPoint slides. And please, you can add notes on the PowerPoint slides to help trigger your memory when you're studying. Um, I always tell my students that when it comes to the exam, I suggest for them to compile all the PowerPoint slides together, of course, separating each PowerPoint um, presentation with your title slide, which includes the chapter so you don't get all confused. But um, this way you'll have them all in one place when it comes to the midterm or the final exam in this course. All right, so now I'm going to jump back to this week's module. All right, so we've pretty much went through most of um, the, you know, the different topics listed here. And here, really, this last diagram talks about the key characteristics of healthcare delivery system. We're looking at the differences between the non-long-term care services and long-term care services. So the key characteristics include that the long-term care system is rationally integrated with the rest of the healthcare system. So this rational integration facilitates easy access to services between two components of a healthcare delivery system. Um, appropriate placement of the patient within the long-term care system is based on an assessment of individual needs. Again, individualization is, folk, you know, is uh, emphasized in long-term care. And the long-term care system accommodates changes in individual needs. Also, long-term care services are designed to compensate for existing impairment and have the objective of promoting independence as much as possible. So that pretty much covers it for Chapter 10 on long-term care. If you have any questions, be sure to email me. And um, again, make sure to read the chapter and go through the PowerPoint presentation and the file with the terms um, that I have included for this week. All right. Take care. Bye.